trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host, Eric Skwarzynski. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm sitting here with someone I've actually known for quite a while, uh, Connor Smith. He pastors Temple Baptist Church in Paris, California. I know I just said Baptist Church. Don't turn off the podcast just yet. Um, (laughs) But I met Connor, um, I mean, at a basketball camp way back when. Uh, I ran into him when he was a dorm supervisor at West Coast Baptist College um, and have just kind of been, I guess, like side by side with you, like from a distance, kind of watching you change and develop. And um, yeah, we've had a lot of conversations off mic. I wanted to bring you on to talk about your kind of experiences, but just go ahead and take our audience back. Let them know a little bit about your introduction to the IFB movement. Sure. And uh, before we, yeah, so we met, I think for the first time at a basketball camp at West Coast Baptist College. Um, But then we also played each other at the Sacramento Kings stadium up in Sacramento. Right. You were there. That was you, right? That yeah. was your yeah. team. Yeah. Uh, so we were obviously really good because we had a whole like 27 people in our schools uh, and <laughs> right. you could walk and breathe. You made the team and we got to, we, <laughs> we got to play at the, That's right. I always forget about that whole trip, but maybe it's because I played for like two minutes, but, uh, but yeah, that, yeah. So the first time we met was actually before you were in college. So it would be at that, yeah, the basketball camp, or maybe you were in college and you were helping. No, I was, I was a junior in, in high school. I think you were in like seventh grade. Or yeah. Or so, like <laughs> so yeah, super weird. Um, but yeah, we we did the basketball camp, played on the Kings court. So that's a shared experience that very few people have with that's, me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have to tell people how bad I actually played. I can just say that I got to play on an NBA floor. Right. Anyway, um, yeah, so my name's Connor. I've been a, a pastor for, uh, it'll be three years in January. Um, I've been in ministry for what, eight years, since 2012, uh, when I graduated college, graduated from West Coast. Um, I'm kind of, I wasn't born into the IFB movement, but I was, uh, that's where I became a Christian when I was 16. Um, and I, I, I mean, when I got in, I got all in, I mean, I jumped right. all the way in right? and ended up graduating from a Christian school, going off to a college, going off to West Coast Baptist college, uh, which is kind of the premier, you know, uh, ministry college, at least, I guess Pensacola would be the only one that would be maybe more prominent, but obviously almost exclusively for liberal arts and, um, then went to work for an independent Baptist pastor. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm no longer, uh, independent Baptist, but I think we're going to get more into that here in here in a second. So. Right. So what was your background before getting into it at 16? Were you religious at all? Was your family completely non-Christian? Were you kind of Christmas and Easter kind of cultural? Yeah, I mean, we were like Christian in name, like anyone that would have asked me, I would have said Christian, but we, I mean, I'd been to church a handful of times in my life. Sure. I was 16. Um, I was living with my dad at the time in North Carolina. Okay. My mom was living in Missouri. Um, she had recently become a Christian at an independent Baptist church uh, and then moved to Chico, California, uh, Pastor mm-hmm. Tim Rule, Pleasant Valley Baptist Church. And that's where she became, uh, that's where they got really involved there. I came out to visit her on a spring break of my, of my sophomore year of high school, right before my 16th birthday. And, um, that's when I was introduced to that kind of church and, um, introduced to one of the associate pastors there who I became friends with just in that one week that I was there, um, became a Christian, had a, had a, you know, faith experience, um, salvation experience. And then, um, came, went back to North Carolina, found a local church, was just there for a couple of months. My dad was not a Christian at all, has mm. since become a Christian, um, and my stepmom wasn't. And so I was getting a ride from a church member to, to the local independent Baptist church there and then ended up finishing my sophomore year and then decided to move back in with my mom in Chico and graduated from the, from the school there. So that's kind of how it all started. 
so obviously you said you were all in. So in, in your mind, it was a very positive experience. And it sounds like in a lot of ways, to be, to be honest, it sounds like it was a positive thing. Um, it, it was a good thing for you in the beginning. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that I, obviously I understand a lot of the people who watch, who watch this and it's difficult to hear how something that hurt you could have been positive for someone else sometimes. Right. And so I want to be careful with that because I, I want to be sensitive to that because I totally get that. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of that stuff up front for sure. Right. And it's definitely where I was exposed to the gospel. And obviously I'm still in ministry. And so the gospel is, uh, I wouldn't say just important, but is like the primary right. thing for me. Like that's a huge deal. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's, it, it, was, it, it, was, it was positive in a lot of ways. And I would say, so I would say there's two, two big positive things, like showing me like a, a love for people, like a servant heartedness, like a, like if you're going to lead people, make sure that you're serving them, like be willing mm-hmm. to kind of get down, get your hands dirty and help other people. Like that was a big thing that I learned early on in that, in that movement yeah. um, that I would say is still helpful to me today. So. Yeah. No, I appreciate you making the distinction because it is, um, you know, I've, I've have definitely some people who are like, well, don't ever say anything positive about it. And I'm like, well, I spent 20 years in it and it wasn't 20 straight years of torture. Right. You know, um, hindsight's 2020. And there's a lot of things I realized now were more harmful than I even gave them credit for. But there's also things like I had great friendships. I, you know, I remember riding my bikes around the church with like my best friends, you know, growing up. I remember, you know, uh, getting to like the tie on to video. That's how I, ironically, like that's how I started doing the things that would lead me to like podcasting and things like that. So yeah, I mean, exactly. yeah, there's a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of really horrible things that are, that are tied in and things that are still, you know, have affected me to this day. But it's, I think it's good to call out the good. And I think it adds a little bit of credibility when you do point out the bad because these are not people that you went into this as a 16 year old. Like I hate my authority figures. I hate all of you. And now I'm still mad about it. Like you were bought in. And I remember the bought in Connor. Like that's who I met was the, <laughs> the, the clean shaven IFB oh, yeah. suit wearing Connor. Um, so what, what changed? Like how, how quickly from the high of like, this is a great positive change to the point where I want to move here and, and be a part of this to noticing like, something's not quite right here. There's something in this world that's not either not resonating with me or doesn't, you know, doesn't jive with what I'm thinking is the right thing to do. Yeah. So that's kind of, I call it, this is the part that I call it my personal reformation. Um, we're coming up on October 31st, Martin Luther and all that stuff. And so this is, uh, it's kind of a time when I think a lot about my own personal reformation transformation with all of this. And, um, so, I would say, so what got me, I know this is going to sound insane, but, uh, what got me to like, want to go into ministry at first and like, maybe I'm being called to be a pastor, which I wouldn't even use that terminology anymore. But, um, was I went to Mount Zion Baptist camp, uh, that, that, that first summer that I was a Christian and, um, I uh, heard Tony Hudson preaching (laughs) And, um, and anybody that follows Twitter and is on IFP preacher clips, I mean, He's uh, he's a uh, he's one of their heavy hitters. So we still call it Sunday school. They turned out they they turned out our vocabulary. They're trying to change our terminology. It's called preaching. I'm not sharing. I'm not sharing. If you go share, you need to put on a dress. Amen. I ain't sharing a blood. I'm trying to preach. I heard him just kind of lighting himself on fire, going crazy, doing his right. hey man thing and all that, all that stuff, learned how to imitate that and, and all those things. And I'm, but, I, but at the same time I was like, but this guy's so passionate about it. Like he loves what he's doing. That's so cool. And, um, I had had big dreams to go off and be a, a prosecutor at that point actually is what I wanted mm. to do. I wanted to go to college and go to law school and become a prosecutor. So, um, but I sort of shifted at that point, decided to go into ministry, spent my junior and senior year really focused in that direction, obviously went off to college and did it. Uh, and then I would say that it was in college that c- certain things started becoming frustrating, just like the overemphasis on marriage relationships, stuff like mm. that, almost making you feel bad for not dating someone, teachers making anyone that didn't have a date to the, you know, the upcoming banquet stand up and then him pairing you off and saying, you ask her right now, right here in front of everyone. It's a class of, you know, 75 people <laughs> just being really embarrassing and 
having interview days happen. And then I wasn't, I wasn't dating. I wasn't engaged, mm-hmm. nothing. And, um, pastors just sort of being, that was one of their first questions. Well, are, are, are you married, engaged? No, seriously. What dating? they're really asking no. is, do you have someone that we can force to also be a coworker for much less pay? <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, <laughs> and this is the, the thing that kind of became funny a couple years after this too, though, is that it also, I, I think in their minds, what it does is it limits the potential for somebody to fall, <laughs> quote okay. unquote, fall into abu- abuse, end up mm. sleeping with one of their teenagers or doing something stupid, which it's just kind of, anyway, that's a whole nother rabbit trail. <laughs> I guess we could go on, but, um, and so that, that ended up being frustrating early on. Also the overemphasis, I think on just pastors and missionaries, kids and yeah. being me coming from like a broken home, mm. coming to college and being like, why don't you guys spend a little bit more time focusing on people that like beat all the odds and got here anyway, right. um, kind of a deal. So that, that, that was just little stuff. Then I came on staff in sort of the traditional way, I guess, in independent Baptist circle, you come on as an intern making a hundred bucks a week or less. And, um, and then I'm, I was the music pastor and two weeks later was the music and youth pastor. And then eventually I was the principal of the Christian school we had here, which was insane because Right. Why would a 23 year old be the principal of a Christian school of any school? Um, and then I was the admin pastor and all these other things. I got married in 2016 and I met my wife on eHarmony. And, and I, I, I already, the minute you start talking about wife, I'm like, I got to plug the eHarmony TV yeah. spot <laughs> into, the, into the episode. Uh, so I literally had one week left on my eHarmony account before my one year subscription expired. And that's when I met Connor. I think one of the things that separates eHarmony from the other online accounts is the questionnaire which takes some time, but in the end, it helped me find the love of my life. I'm just glad that I I stuck it out for the long run, so. Do you want fast or forever? It doesn't happen overnight, but Shannon and Connor found their happily ever after. Stop waiting. Start communicating for free today. I met my wife on eHarmony, and it's funny, like, I remember when Paul Chapel came out to visit our church one time and preached for us, and back when I was on just on staff, and um, and he asked me how we met and I remember like, I knew he was going to ask me. And so I was just prepped to just be proud about it. Like, I'm just going to be open and I'll never forget the look on his, he like, didn't know what to do with that information, but, <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> um, anyway, so we got married and, um, it was a few months after that, that I was invited by the, our church, which this makes our, the fact that we had, a, that it was an independent Baptist church at that time makes it kind of an anomaly. We had a plurality of pastors, we had elders, mm-hmm. Um, and so there was no grand poobah kind of a person. There was, uh, yes, a, a teaching pastor, but then he had other people that were equal in authority to him. Then we also had deacons and their job was just to serve, uh, and, you know, visit the widows and the hungry and those kinds of things. So, um, a couple of the elders invited me to go to John MacArthur's shepherds conference in, um, in LA And I know that for most people to say, (laughs) anyone that's not IFB, when they think of John MacArthur, they think about his fundamental and strict. Right. Uh, And our circles, though, and I'm sure you remember this, was John MacArthur was a liberal. He didn't believe, you know, you've posted some of those videos of Jack Hiles and, you know, John MacArthur and your bloodless gospel and all that stuff, right? Enjoy yourself, John MacArthur, with your bloodless gospel. You'll see that blood when Sunday comes. And I'm going to take you myself to the mercy seat in heaven. I'm going to show it to you. And if Jesus let me, I'm going to rub your nose in it. Enjoy yourself. Sunday's going to come. Enjoy yourself, Swindoll. Enjoy yourself, Dobson. Sold out to the Catholics in Colorado Springs. Enjoy yourself with your convictionless Christianity catering to a pagan world. And get your crowds by your compromise. And get your crowds by your, co- by your pussyfooting and air tickling. And give the people what they want. But bless God, this is your hour, but you got in for the shock of your life. Because on Sunday morning, we fundamentalists are taking over. I went there, and I knew he was a Calvinist too. And Calvinists, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget John Hamlin coming to chapel at West Coast Baptist College. And him saying... I'd soon as take a Calvinist and hold him over hellfire and watch him burn. Right. And, uh, and I just remember being like, Oh my gosh. And, um, uh, so that in my head was what Calvinists were. They could, they didn't believe in evangelism. They didn't believe in missions. They didn't believe in any of this stuff. 
And so I kind of reluctantly went and I remember sitting through the first service and I had my arms crossed and I'm listening to John MacArthur preach from John 17 on this high priestly prayer. Somebody might say, well, praying for himself? Yes. Yes. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given Him He may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with Yourself, with the glory which I had with You before the world was." That's the nature of His prayer. It is a prayer, first of all, for His own glory, so that having been glorified, He can then bring many sons to glory. He kind of got into like some Calvinism type stuff. And this is, by the way, not a plug for Calvinism. I wouldn't even describe myself as a Calvinist. Uh, however, too bad. You're a nice guy. <laughs> I, I, if, when people ask me kind of where I stand, I always tell them I lean reformed. I lean reformed, right. but I'm, I'm slow to adopt labels. And I think part of that probably has something to do with where I come from. But um, so anyway, uh, I remember though, over the next three or four days that we're there for this conference, I'm listening to people who are just passionate, like some of the most passionate evangelists, like challenging us to be evangelistic and share our faith and talk to other people and have a passion for theology and growing in the word of God, not being afraid to to, to do all these things. And I remember just kind of like all of this, it was sort of like the domino effect after that, because it was like, wait a second, I was lied to that. Mm -hmm. That's not true. And everything I was told about Calvinism wasn't true. And then I started looking into like the Southern Baptist convention too, because I thought, well, they're all liberals and they deny some of the fundamentals of the faith. That's not true. You can't be in the Southern Baptist convention and deny any. And when I say fundamentals, I'm talking about virgin birth of Christ, inerrancy of the Bible, uh, substitutionary atonement, those kinds of things. We're not talking about any of the weird standard things. Right. And, uh, and so it kind of sent me on, this weird path where like this deconstruction path of like, wait, I, I don't know what, what am I supposed to believe now? Everything I was taught wasn't true. Uh, or at least a lot that I was taught wasn't true. I shouldn't say everything, but so I went back and I started having some conversations with some of these elders almost like quietly though, because I knew that to, to open some of these doors could, I mean, get me fired or, uh, lose connections. And, um, so I, um, I started talking to one elder in particular, and, and then I said, I, I told him a few months later that I was really questioning the whole King James only position. I was questioning the, the, the logic of all of that. And so he gave me a book by James White called The King James Controversy. Um, and I would not recommend James White for very many things. I think he's kind of a, not the nicest person. I'll just put it that way for now, but um, he's not, he's not gracious at all. And, um, but his book was phenomenal. Yeah, and his, really his books are me. great. <laughs> his book was yeah. f- absolutely fantastic. And it, I, was, I think I was four chapters in and I bought my first ESV and I would only read it in the house and I would hide it when people came over and all that kind of stuff. But it was, it was literally like reading the Bible for the first time. No, yeah. like, no joke. It was like reading the Bible for the very first time and understanding that a lot of the arguments were just, I mean, to, to be perfect, they were, they were just silly for lack of a better term, yeah. I guess. They just didn't make a lot of sense. Right. Um, And so I understand the heart behind wanting to be KJV only, but it just, we're, we're, we're to to love the Lord, our God with all of our heart, all of our soul and all of our mind. And uh, part of that means to then use the mind that God's given us. Right. And that, that's not a, that, that doesn't lead to a KJV only position, um, in, in my opinion. So, um, what was the, where was I getting to with all that? Um, so I was just saying, what was the thing that kind of shook you out of it? So you mentioned like, obviously going to MacArthur's understanding that there were things I've been taught to you that were not completely accurate, if not completely false. And, (laughs) um, and kind of, you started diving into the King James only. So, yeah. And, but that was sort of like the last big, like card to fall. Mm -hmm. And then I remember my wife and I sitting down in our living room at the time we'd been married for like seven or eight months. And, um, we just started talking about the idea of like, I don't think this is where we, where we fit. And so we, and was she at that time, was she IFB before meeting you? No, no. She okay. was from a non-denominational church. And did, um, 
did she ever point out weird things coming into that as an outsider or she again she kind of came into it like i did she didn't see any of i mean she thought the kjv thing was a little kind of goofy um but she's like but I mean, whatever, if you want me to use it, fine. I mean, I'll do it. I like right. you more than I like my Bible, but I don't really care. Um, and uh, and then like the dress thing was was weird to like to have to wear that to church. Our church was not super strict on that, even though like outside of church though. Um, and so, yeah, th- there were some things like that that she was kind of like, it's a little goofy, but there weren't any of the big kind of red flags. She hadn't seen them. And um, what I'm grateful, she had, literally zero influence over any of my decisions. But I will say that I think being married to someone that I knew came from more of a non-denominational background was helpful for me because I didn't have to then also convince my wife um, yeah. of all the same things I was coming to. Cause when I would share stuff with her, she was like, well, yeah, I believe that like my whole life. <laughs> yeah, um, right. I've always thought that was a little weird, but, um, and so we ended up leaving, uh, right. And I started going to school online, trying to work toward my master's degree. Um, she was uh, she got a job out in Pasadena. She's from Glendora, California. And so we ended up going out there and we were part of a church called Foothill Church, um, which is a larger church. And for a while, we were just we were just members. And it was like the first time in a long time that I've been able to just sit in church. Right. Um, and I remember our first Sunday just kind of being overwhelmed with like emotion uh, because I didn't have to do anything else. I was just focused on like, worshiping God and reading scripture and prayer and taking communion. And, um, it was, uh, it was a very interesting experience and I eventually got to go on staff there and I got to see what a healthy grace filled church environment was all about for really the first time, I think. And, uh, that was a massive, massive turning point for me. So, Hmm. well, I mean, you, you talked obviously like the theological, changes, which were that, that fueled a lot of my change too. But you, you, you know, you mentioned like red flags. I'm curious because obviously on the show, we deal a lot with like, you know, abuse and scandals and cover-ups and things like that. Did you have in your mind at that point? Cause I know obviously from that point on, I know there's been a lot of red flags in that area, but up to that point, was it all theological or did you have any red flags where you felt like, Oh, the movement has issues with covering abuse or things like this? Yeah. So it was while I was in college that the church that I was originally a part of the, the pastor's son, who was, um, my coach, um, he ended up having some sort of relationship. Again, I, none of the details have ever really come out into the open. So I don't, I don't want to try to assume what did and didn't happen. Um, but enough that it was a crime and he was, uh, and he was, I believe you would probably know better than I would, I believe convicted, um, but yeah. not registered as an offender. Um, and uh, that I remember being, that, that shook me hard. Cause it, I mean, I was close to my coach and stuff like that, but um, and then right after the year I, I graduated in 2012 in May and just a couple months later was when the Scott thing came out. For Chicago area, mega church pastor is being called a sinner tonight, dismissed from his church. And CBS2 is learning more about why. His name is Dr. Jack Scott of the First Baptist Church in Hammond. The staunch Baptist preacher and married father is accused of inappropriate conduct with a younger member of his church. CBS2's Brad Edwards live in Hammond with the late developments. Brad. Good evening, Kate and Jim. The charismatic leader led his church to 15,000, ousted for a relationship that now has authorities investigating which is everyone wondering. From the pulpit. Hey, oh, you listen to me right now. I still believe it'd be a cold day in hell before I get my theology from a woman. I'm a preacher. I, I wasn't mama called Papa sent. The seemingly pious man preached until the bow broke. His first Baptist, the biggest thing in Hammond, a main auditorium, a secondary Spanish speaking, a mega Sunday school, a parking ramp. It even owns the former federal courthouse, its headquarters. The sheriff told CBS2 via phone, quote, two high-ranking individuals came to my office early this morning. We have initiated an investigation. We asked if it was sexual in nature. The sheriff said, quote, yes, that's the nature. And Scott had been at our church up in Chico uh, just a couple years before. Like I'd met, my mom was working at the church at that time in their their daycare preschool thing. And so we, uh, I actually like had dinner with the guy. And I remember just being this very, uh, just creepy. And, um, and then 
slowly, very slowly is when I was starting to realize like how much of a pattern this was right. uh, in, in fundamentalism. And, um, and then I would say that though, it probably wasn't until really just a couple years ago that I started realizing like, and, and a lot of that had to do with you and the, and the podcast exposing it a, a little bit more of a, of a wide array. But also it was a lot of the things that you were pointing out in the podcast, I'd kind of known about them just in just loosely. Um, mm-hmm. And then it was sort of drawing the like the connections between all of it and how David right. Gibbs comes into that. And, right. um, and then a lot, and then remembering a lot of things that David Gibbs, David Gibbs was very involved at our church in Chico, very involved at West coast while I was there. I believe the Bible commands us to identify clearly with those that for doing right are suffering adversity. He's a man whose church was literally put under assault with accusation. If Brother Ballinger were just taken out of that seat and you were brought up here to sit in that chair, how much encouragement would you like? Oh, you say, Brother Gibbs, if I had to sit there, oh, I'd want people to identify with me. Brother Gibbs, I'd want them to encourage me. I believe the Bible commands it. This is a man of integrity. These are men of honor and integrity. Here's a church that is going to be an encouragement to this good man. The joy of my life is to stand with churches. The joy of my life is to defend the faith. I have never been involved in a greater defense of the faith than I'm involved in today. We've had the privilege as legal missionaries to say it would be our honor to help and do it as a ministry. Any student, any child can by God's grace be safe here. And we are going to be sure that as a matter of integrity, whenever there is a misstep or misdeed, it's clearly going to be called into the light and corrected immediately. Yeah. And I was very tied in with the IFB world. I mean, when people, I know, I I feel like there's some people that maybe just grew up in it for a few years or just had sort of a bad experience, but like, this wasn't for me, this wasn't like a brief moment in my life or something that I was just, I just happened to be a member of an independent Baptist church. I mean, I was a member there. I was saved there. I was baptized there. I was, uh, I graduated from their Christian school. I mean, I was literally there my junior senior high school. I was there Monday through Friday for school. I was there on Saturday for soul winning. I was there on Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. I graduated. I went to one of their Bible colleges. I came back home and I interned at their church in the summer. I went on tour group. I um, mean, I was close with all of the, the VPs at West Coast. Uh, I graduated and had plenty of recommendations from the administration there and still know plenty of the professors there and went off and worked at an independent Baptist church. I mean, I know this world. Uh, yeah. It was my everything for, for quite some right. time. Yeah. I was curious about that. Cause I mean, obviously I know like some of the interactions you had and encounters with, um, with abuse in the, in that world and seeing it firsthand. But I was curious if those had been red flags in regards to the movement or just in your mind, cause like you said, bought in and this is what I did. Yeah. Um, or this is what I see a lot of people do is they tend to write those off as these kind of isolated incidents, you know? And, um, you know, for me, it was kind of a more extreme and where I just assumed until I did encounter something, I assumed it was something that happened occasionally at other religious organizations, not yeah, our sure. own. Um, yeah. So that's a good point because like when, cause a lot of the Catholic stuff came out long before even 2020 right. did their thing on the independent Baptist movement. And right? IFP pastors let you know that whenever they mention Catholics. In Absolutely. The they do. Yeah. Don't let right. your kids go there and they make some, you know, off color. Right. joke. And, and look, I understand that. I understand the call to shut down the Catholic church. It's a political machine from the top down. Yeah, but It is absolutely infiltrated mm-hmm. with decades and decades. Absolutely. And it's, we're not talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We're talking about parishes around the country. We're talking about them having to pay us money. Of thousands, tens of, of thousands. Now that oh, absolutely. is systemic. a systemic problem. Yes, all right. Sir. The thing for me though is that because I was so bought in, I was also bought into the excuse that's really easy to get. You, in a Catholic church, the hierarchy is so established. So I mean, you have your priests, you have your bishops, you have you know you have the pope. You, it's very yeah. this very established 
hierarchy. You don't have that in independent Baptist world. And so it's very easy to say, well, you can't judge a whole group off of a few bad apples. And really, you can't judge anybody off of any other church or any other leader because um, they're all independent. I mean, that's right. Connor. That's the, that's the big deal here. We're independent, fundamental Baptist churches, aren't we? Um, mm-hmm. And therefore, we don't do that. <laughs> it's, and I, it's, you know, people have said that to me since I've left, like I'm like I'm unfamiliar with the argument. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just it, they are independent almost in name only. Now, are there churches that are truly independent? No. Yes. But are there very many? And are there any of the known independent Baptist churches that are truly independent? I can't think no. of one. I can't think of one. Right. Um, and the way they're organized, though, is instead of a hierarchy of these people oversee your church, it's more of the, it's the, just the good old boy system. And it's, it's really organized around the Bible colleges. And anyone that knows much about this world knows about the, the, the camps. And I remember hearing that word when I was a senior in high school and meeting with a, a missionary who was there for a conference. And he mentioned that term and I tried to get him to explain it to me. And he's like, don't, it's too complicated. Um, but growing up now, having like really been in it, there's the West Coast Baptist College camp. And they love to criticize the Hiles Anderson camp, which they're really just a child of Jack Hiles. Yeah. I mean, that, that they are absolutely an outflow of it. They don't. They they they're just a little bit more dressed up. They got more makeup on it than that uh, yeah. than, than than the Hiles group does. Um, and do you have the the Crown camp and the Golden State camp and the Hiles camp and the and then you've got sort of the Texas camp with Texas Baptist College and Bob Gray Senior and uh, some of those guys and. Um, but then many of those camps will interact with each other. You've got, you know, crown and golden state do a lot together now. And, right. um, so anyway, the, it, it is, it is absolutely organized. And then if you go against the unspoken hierarchy, you're blacklisted. Right. So if any of your job, any of your income was ever dependent upon speaking out at youth conferences, which seems to be just a huge thing in the IFB world, uh, or pastors conferences or revival meetings or missions conferences or any of that. I mean, you say the wrong thing, you upset the wrong person and you're blacklisted and all that goes away. Right. Um, and so to, to say that, that to still try to call that independent, I think is, is, is just honestly, it's a joke. It's, it's not independent at all. (laughs) Right. Uh, And when people say, well, there's good ones, well, yeah, of course there's good ones. There's just like there's good priests. Yeah. Uh, there's good Mormons. They're not all Warren Jeffs. They're not all, you yeah. know, they're not all sleeping with 13 year olds. But I mean, when you look at the statistics of it, it's a, it's a much higher likelihood to have a pastor abuse, uh, abuse a kid in an independent Baptist church than it is to have a Catholic priest do it. Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, I'm curious and when I say I'm curious, I kind of know, but, uh, but I'm curious, um, if you'd explain like, so you, you leave temple um, where you're at now. So you leave that um, for a lot of reasons. You, you go off, you're finding this sort of thing. You're kind of out of that world. Um, and also similar to what I did, I was out and then it just drags you back in. Um, <laughs> how, how did you end up back at temple? And, and what was that experience like kind of returning to that world and why, why return in the first place? Why not just say, this is kind of crazy. I'm out. I'm married. <laughs> We're kind of doing our own thing now. What what took you back? So when I talk about the churches, the few independent Baptist churches that were truly independent, um, there was a time before before I ever had anything to do with this church. There was a time when this church was that, and it was about 10, 10 years ago. Um, until until about ten years ago, this church really was truly independent. Like they didn't know that West Coast Baptist College is like an hour and twenty minutes away, and they're an independent Baptist church that hmm. usually keeps James Bible. Um, those kinds of things. The the former pastor came and uh, was here for seven years. He was a person I worked for. He was very much ingrained in the IFB world, similar to where I was. He graduated from school in Oklahoma and um, he was here and I worked for him. And um, he's the one that got it really like tied in with West Coast and bringing tour groups in and kind of getting it back on that track. And for seven years, he did that. And I, I was a big part of that, too. I mean, I, I was a West Coast grad and I was here with a couple of other West Coast grads who were teachers and assistant pastors and all that kind of stuff. Um, I left, obviously, in 2016, in August of 2016. In December of 2016, there was... Uh, a meeting that was held with the elders and the deacons and the pastor of the church um, and a couple of staff members. And basically some, 
the, the pastor wanted that meeting. He wanted that he'd heard about some grievances and he basically said, well, let everybody come and, and say it to my face. And so they, they, everybody came together and uh, some things were said and I, I wasn't there. So I'm not going to try to speak to everything that was said. And it's not for me to get into the details because uh, I, I, but I have talked to pretty much all of the people that were in the room when it happened. And basically it ended in a violent altercation um, between the pastor and another one of the elders. Uh, and obviously at that point he was, he was no longer going to be here anymore. So that was December of 2016. And um, I was called the night that it happened by one of the staff members. And I said, I'll, I'll be there on Sunday. I'll be there on Sunday because I love these people. I mean, I was here for five years. I worked here for almost five years and um, these people were my friends and uh, closer than a lot of my family. And I mean, I, I just cared about them. Um, and I, I, I mean, a lot of these kids, I was their youth pastor from freshman all the way through senior year, that kind of a thing. And so I came down for two weeks and just sort of filled in and helped them out so they could just kind of get their heads on straight. Um, I left for a couple more months and then they asked me to come and be the, like the interim pastor, sort of, um, I said, I won't be that, but I, I I'll, I'll come and I'll preach for you for two months. I want a firm end date on it. Cause I don't want to try to, I don't want to be staying there indefinitely. Don't want to be the pastor. Uh, I don't agree with, with, with a lot of things anymore. Um, and I will help you get some things in place to start looking for new pastors and putting policies and procedures in place to hopefully avoid some of the things that, that led to all this happening. Right. And so, we did that. Uh, I was there through March and April, I think it was, of 2017. Um, they ended up bringing in a few candidates. They ended up hiring another pastor. He was here for like three weeks and then resigned um, because basically he was just like, there's too much baggage and I don't want to deal with it. So he peaced out. Right. And um, it was actually that day that that happened because that my wife came to me first and she just said, hey, I think I might be open to coming like to going back to Paris. I know that sounds crazy, but I, I think maybe we should think about it. And you're like, that's great for you. <laughs> well, no, I, I had actually been thinking about it ever since like back in December, because remember it was the, it was the, the leaders of the church, the pastors of the church that first got me on my own reformation anyway. Right. So I knew there was an openness to not being this kind of this independent fundamental Baptist church. I knew that there was at least an openness there. And I knew what the history was before that, before the, the former pastor ever got here. Um, and so I knew that it didn't have to be that way. Um, and so, but I knew she was like out on it. Like she was totally out on it. She did not want to have to go back into that. And so, but she came to me and she's like, we should, I think we should think about it. And so we started praying about it and having some conversations. And I called the, the elders of the church here and I just said, Hey, we, we're actually open to it. If you guys, if you guys are like, just let us know. It's like a month later, they called us. We ended up coming out in December of 2017 and, and doing like a full blown candidation thing. And then we got hired in January of, uh, of 18 to, to come on board. And, um, it was like, there were a couple things that I was like, it needs to be pretty clear. We're not using, you know, I was very upfront in my candidation, like in the, in my interview with deacons, elders, and the whole church got to ask me Q and a, um, we're not, we're not going to be a King James only church. Um, we're going to join the Southern Baptist convention. Um, hmm. I can explain that if you want later, but, um, yeah. And so we, that's what we did. And thankfully I had four and a half years of like leadership capital to sort of cash in on right. for some of those things. Um, and so it wasn't like just some, some green guy coming in from off the streets and trying to turn everything upside down. But, um, we officially joined about six months after I became the pastor, we joined the Southern Baptist convention. Um, we started using the Christian standard Bible, um, and we've made some other changes since then, but, um, that's kind of, that was sort of the completion of, uh, of all of that. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, I am curious, what, what was the push to join the, the SBC and not remain independent? What was the, what was the goal there? First of all, just the, the reputation of the independent Baptist movement. Like I don't, and, and that was, that's what I would actually say to anybody that like, it's not bad to stay independent. Like feel free, stay independent. Don't call yourself independent Baptist church. Just don't no. do it. Uh, well, I mean, MacArthur's I'm, technically an independent Baptist church. Yeah. I've like, I, they're actually part of an actual denomination called the IFCA independent fundamental churches of America. Um, again, I just wouldn't use the terminology. I think the yeah. connotation is just not good. It doesn't bring anything positive to anyone's mind. Um, and so if someone wants to say on the side, like I'm a fundamentalist, 
I guess technically I am too, in the sense that I believe in the seven fundamentals of what Christianity is. But even that word's been so hijacked by its own adherence of, you know, when you hear fundamentalist, you're thinking radical Yep. jihadist Christian, you know, like that's kind of what you think is this Westboro like, Baptist kind of, kind right. Of yeah. So even if it's true, like, and I tell people I I've reverted to say more Orthodox, like I adhere to Orthodox Christianity. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, even that has its own weird, everything has its own weird connotation because all these terms have been around for hundreds and thousands of years. So they've gotten tainted in their own ways, but um, Orthodox is one though that I, yeah, I would be willing to adopt that before right. I would adopt the, the term fundamentalist. Um, right. I think if somebody was going to be a Baptist church still, um, and they're not going to join any particular Baptist denomination. Um, and so they're technically independent. I think that if I were in their shoes, I would simply say, we're a Baptist church unaffiliated with a, with a traditional denomination. Um, right. Is that that's a way that you could stay that way? Then you can still fellowship with whoever you want to. But as a Southern Baptist, I can fellowship with whoever I want to. But um, for us, it was this is the most missional organization, literally on the face of the planet. Um, another part of it was watching how they did handle um, abuse allegations that had come to light. You know, the Houston yeah. Chronicle did a whole thing. Um, I think it's like been like two years now since they since they did their their piece on that. Um, and I. As far as higher ups go, and you, you you may know more about this than I would, um, but as far as higher ups go, I don't know anyone that tried to cover that up. Uh, right. I know I I know they hired independent investigators from the outside to come in and actually do full blown investigations. What I wouldn't give to see North Valley Baptist Church do that. What I wouldn't give to see uh, Hiles Anderson do that. Uh, right. I'd give anything for that. I think it would take away at this point, it would probably be a little bit too little too late, but I mean, had they done that. Well, and they the will never do it because of the amount of stuff that would come out. Right. <laughs> the, and it would hold them so liable for everything. Right. They would have to. Yeah. I mean, the SBC, I mean, obviously I think in the last year has had a, quite a bit of shakeup as, as far as this issue. Um, and I know there's, but, but I mean, I have, the SBC is so split um, in its, in its work is you have your very, traditional and now there's honestly three camps so you have your conservative baptist network which is like just yeah in my in my very humble opinion is a dumpster fire section of that world and most of the people there are ifb that want to be part of the sbc yes. um i know some of the people in that um i do too. camp and we probably know the same people um yeah. and then you've got the um very traditional southern baptist kind of camp which is which is just a very reserved portion it's more the arminian leaning you know all yeah. of those things very ifb as well and then you have yeah. your uh, yes in, you know in their the in their Baptist network i think is that's a fair assessment i think the, the more traditional kind i wouldn't i wouldn't link not ifb guys. in the sense of of the negative i would say the traditional they're very traditional they're yeah, not very, sure, yeah. sure, sure. um and, and i would then, say that's probably the fastest dying group within that right SBC. Yeah. And then you've got your more quote unquote liberal. Um, I would just say progressive would be a better word, maybe. But even that doesn't really honestly sum it up. But you have no because they're extreme. Who, I know the group you're talking about. You're talking about the JD Greers and the Matt right. Chandlers and the, the Albert Mollers and the Russell Moores and all these. Here, people. Here's a better word: normal. You have your normal group, which <laughs> because are, I would, I'm trying to think of any position that would be progressive theologically, right. and I couldn't think of one. Would, they are yeah, absolutely 110 yeah. percent theologically conservative, but right. yes, when it comes to issues of racial justice or right. um, sexual misconduct, or right. and being willing to talk about it and saying, no, we are not going to try to cover this up, or we're right. not, and we're not going to try to even make it vague. We're going to be very upfront. We're going to be very direct. We're going to address it yeah. head on. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think, I think what you're saying too, is just like, cause there, there are, there's, um, I, I'm forgetting his name right now, but there's a, there's a SBC pastor who's been, he's just been reported on constantly cause he keeps getting moved around to different churches and keeps speaking, getting platforms. And there was even a church out here in Vegas that I was like, Oh, that's on our do not check out list because they just ha- host him at their platform. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm seeing from leadership like JD Greer and from some of the high ups is like a zero tolerance 
policy yeah. on this. And like, they're very clear about that. A recent investigation by the Houston Chronicle and San Antonio Express News found more than 700 people had been sexually assaulted by nearly 400 Southern Baptist Church leaders and volunteers over the past 20 years. Yes, it can happen in your church. Responding to growing complaints of inaction, officials at the Southern Baptist Church annual convention are trying to address the issue. J.D. Greer is president of the Southern Baptist Convention. But I know the vast majority of Southern Baptist pastors are not uncaring, but many of them are complacent because they're asleep kind of at the wheel. Russell Moore heads the SBC's Ethics Commission, which has issued new recommendations to protect sexual assault victims. And one of the things that will be talked about uh, at this convention is how to uh, how to hold one another accountable. We're we're autonomous churches, but autonomy doesn't mean or shouldn't mean a lack of accountability. It is messy because while they are an organization, they also to allow a lot of independence in their churches. So they are. They're but, not um, super centralized. However, and that's what I and actually I kind of wrote this this point down earlier for myself, but they are independent technically, but if you, there's a lot of benefits that you get for being a part of a Southern Baptist convention. There's a lot of misconceptions. Again, this is one of the things that made me really, that I've had to struggle with some bitterness and, and anger at times from my IFB roots is because so much of what I was told wasn't true. It just was mm-hmm. a lie. Um, I was told they're theologically liberal. I was told that they uh, don't really love evangelism. I was told that um, they're, they're only concerned about humanitarian care and not any gospel care. And that's, Right. All of it's false. Yeah. And um, they're, well, they do and, the, um, the Lottie Moon offering every year, which is like the biggest. <laughs> like mission, Yeah, the, the single biggest, biggest missions, missions offering thing. in the world yeah. and has been for like 120 years or something. Like it's just right. something like that. And um, and so, but there's benefits as like uh, discounts to the seminary. So you don't get money directly from them. If you're a church plant, you can go through certain things and you could, you, you may be able to get funding, but again, that's all still supported by other churches. It's called the cooperative program, meaning all like 40,000 churches or whatever pool their resources to make things happen. It, uh, right. and so, um, yeah, so there's benefits like uh, discounts in that, like our local association for the convention um, is providing us with a stage the whole time that we're here. We didn't have to go out and spend a few thousand dollars on a stage to have outdoor services. Um, there are, uh, there's, there's conferences and camps and all kinds of different things that you can take advantage of. Right. And I'm, I, I don't, I'm not even thinking of all the things that you can do now. The, 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 the teeth, I guess you could call it, of the SBC that they're allowed to do, though, is they will disfellowship you, meaning you have no access to any of those resources. You are not a Southern Baptist church, and you are not part of the Southern Baptist Convention, and we will publicly call you out, basically, right. and say, you are no longer a part of us, right. and we want nothing to do with you. And I've watched in just the last couple of years, they've done this with churches that have said black people can't come to their churches. Hmm. Um, there was a church that hired somebody who was a registered sex offender, and they tried. To, there was one here locally where they tried wow. to join our local association. And I met with our, uh, our association president, and he said, there's no way on God's green earth you are ever coming in. They're like, don't you believe in redemption? yeah, but we're not stupid. Um, and that's just, that's not going to happen. Um, that has been something that I've had a huge amount of respect for. And I respect a church's ability to be independent. Um, but I think being totally fully saying no one can ever have any involvement in, uh, in making sure we stay free of sin, um, and that we're being uh, objective in how we're handling things. I think that's just ridiculous and harmful. So moving beyond the, the, you know, the broader scope of like what denomination you affiliate with, um, I'm just curious from a pastoral perspective, because I think this is the perspective you bring that's interesting is you, you pastored at this church, you know, in an assistant pastor role, being traditional IFB and the church being very traditional in that culture. But now you wouldn't know that looking at your live stream now that that's the root. So what has been the process of of kind of steering the ship a little bit and, and trying to, you know, lead the congregation out of, because, because I got to assume a church been there that long. There's people here that are heavily rooted in that mindset. Uh, Not really. Hmm. Um, There there were a few that came during my predecessor's time here. Um, And most of them have left. Hmm. Uh, there was not any sort of church split 
There was not a mass exodus at any point of people. Um, but there were a few and some of them hurt pretty bad. Cause again, I wasn't some new guy coming in that they, that they, they hired. You, you had history. Like yeah. I knew yeah. these people. I love these people. I still love these people. Um, and it, it just, it hurt, you know, right. uh, especially when the reasons for leaving have nothing to do with the gospel. They have nothing to do with whether or not I preach the Bible. Um, there are things of like certain programs that they didn't, that they wanted that weren't there anymore. Um, or I, I think one, two, two families, I believe left specifically over, over music, um, and not, not have the thing is though, is that I didn't, I'm not the one that brought the drums were there before I got there. Uh, they, they, during the time when there was a year, almost a year without a pastor, a little over a year, um, they had brought some, some other instruments and stuff like that. And like I said, that, that was something they actually used to have back in the past as well. So, um, but I was pretty clear up front about the things that were going to change on day one. And then I also said that I'm going to do my best to not make any major changes for the first year. Um, other than that, because I'm not trying to put your, I'm not trying to put your spiritual world into a tailspin. That wasn't my goal at all, but I didn't want our church to be healthy. Um, but man, the thing that I have that's so different from other people is that we already had a plurality of elders. And, uh, they were all, f- I mean, they were all in my corner and behind me from day one, not, not to say we agreed on every single thing, but most things we did. And even, and even in areas of disagreement, none of them were major enough that we couldn't leave the room without, without being in agreement. Um, or at least saying we're, we're, we're going to be on the same page. We're going to come out on an equal, you know, an equal front. But, um, that, that was a huge part of it. And so then I didn't have to be my own apologist. Like there, there was a whole group of six of us that were kind of linked arm in arm saying, Hey, we're, we're together in this. Let's go and pastor our people and, and love them and meet with them one-on-one and talk to them and have phone calls and go out for coffee. And that was something that I said on my first, before I started and on my first Sunday was just like, I, I really, I want to go out to coffee or lunch with every single person here. I don't think we did that necessarily, but we did, a, we did meet with a lot of people. Um, and so yeah. And, and I think we tried to buy a house immediately right away too. So I, I think, I think part of it was people knew my heart too. They knew my heart for ministry. They knew my heart for, for them. They knew that I love them. They knew that no one in their right mind is going to move to Paris, California, um, unless they actually love people there because right. there's nothing about this place that makes anybody go. Woo-hoo. Um, right. even, I mean, I, I met with the mayor here a couple, a few months ago, and he even said, like, you're the only pastor I know that actually lives in Paris. All the other pastors live in richer communities outside of here because hmm. they don't want to put their families here. Um, and for us, that was something that on day one, we said, we want to live here. Um, yeah. We want to buy a house here to show people that we're not going anywhere and that kind of thing. And so I think a lot of that, I think it was more of those kinds of things than it was people trusted me. I don't know. People knew the heart behind it and knew that it wasn't just some desire to be cool or hip or whatever the case might've been. It was, it was really a desire to, to reach people with the gospel. Part of our savior's true greatness is that he did not seek greatness for himself. And what a mistake it is then for us to play the kind of spiritual one-upmanship that the disciples played. My church is better than your church. My, my worship, the, the way I do worship, that's more pleasing than your worship. The way, the way we do music, yeah, it's, that's, that's better than the way you do music. My, my ministry, it's more important than your ministry. My way of living the Christian life, my way of educating my children, oh, public school, Christian school, charter school, homeschool, whatever, is better than the way you do it. My way of witnessing for Jesus is better than your way of witnessing for Jesus. Do you see the utter contradiction to the word of God that kind of attitude would have? These are the kinds of things that Christians think, and sometimes Christians even say, even if we don't say it in such an obvious way, sometimes we even try to gain an advantage by being more broken for our sins, more sacrificial in our giving than someone else. Anything to prove our own true spiritual greatness. Make no mistake, there isn't anything great about you or me. Nothing. J.C. Ryle wrote this, Of all creatures, none has so little right to be proud as man. And of all men, none ought to be so humble as the Christian. Everything we have is a gift of God's grace. And one of the best ways for us to show our gratitude is by loving the people who usually get overlooked. Looking at the movement now and having experience in it, 
and out of it. Um, when you look at the the IFB movement, the, the question I always ask people is, do you think that there's hope for some kind of reformation or transformation? Um, you know, my my view has shifted a little bit here and there throughout the episodes and hearing different perspectives and stories. But I'm curious, when you look at the movement, do you look at a movement that just needs to be done away with and then something replacing it? Or do you think that there is a chance for people inside to kind of quote unquote, steer the ship back to something? No, I think you had a guest that said pretty much something similar to what I would probably say. I think when you talk about steering the ship back, back to what, Mm, Uh, you know, I just had my, my dad and stuff the other day and they were asking me some questions about, uh, some of my own changes in my, in my spiritual life and, uh, my, my theology and, and certain things out into the history of, of Jack Hiles, but really, I mean, really you have to go back to even J Frank Norris. Um, and that, that first Exodus out of the Southern Baptist convention back in the twenties, which back then actually made sense to be making an Exodus for there were, there were the fundamentals of virgin birth, substitutionary atonement, those kinds of things being, being done away with, or at least being like, uh, de-emphasized. And so you had guys like J. Frank Norris who started leaving. Um, but J. Frank Norris was such, I don't know whether any other word for it. He was insane. I mean, the man was crazy. Um, he shot, I think he shot two people, but one of them was in his office. Um, and he claimed self-defense got off from it, but the evidence is anything clear on that, uh, as far as the report go. And so, um, a lot of what what started the independent Baptist movement, I mean, kind of goes back to that Baptist Bible Fellowship, Frank Norris uh, personality. Uh, that that's what, and, and I and I think that it is the entire IFB movement has been built on the backs of personalities like his. Um, and so you had him, and then in the fifties you got guys like John R. Rice. Um, and, I mean, you had Billy Graham for a little bit until he ventured off on his own and sort of separated from John R. Rice. But a lot of people don't realize that that John R. Rice and Billy Graham actually did stuff together back in the day. Um, and John R. Rice, I think, would be very disappointed in a lot of the um, the stuff of IFB today. But John R. Rice had plenty of his own issues. I mean, right. the guy. Yeah, things on race and sexual. I mean, anyway, there there are some areas where the, I, I remember reading his book on the home, or so. I think it's just called the home by John R. Rice or something like that. And uh, it, it's got some some troubling things in it. Um, but I mean, he wasn't KJV only. Which and a lot of what a lot of people don't realize is that Independent Baptist didn't become KJV only until like the seventies and eighties. Uh, right. It wasn't even a thing. Um, yeah. But but then you get Jack Hiles, and. Jack Hiles is the genesis of what is known today yeah. as the independent fundamental Baptist movement. Yeah, Again, are there camps? Yes, there are camps and there's always going to be, I guarantee you there's some of your IFB. Oh, let's be gracious here. I asked God to help me be gracious in my, in my wording here before I started this interview. Um, there are some of your IFB followers who would say, Things like, well, we're not, you know, we would disagree with Jack Hiles too. Yes, but why do your why does your church exist today? Probably Jack Hiles is somewhere in the mix. Yeah, of those the days. influence is there. The yeah, yeah. Um, and so, Crown College, West Coast Baptist College, uh, Bob Jones, not anymore, but it certainly did. Uh, Pensacola, probably the least, but still influenced. Definitely your Texas Baptist colleges by far Golden State. I mean, Golden State yeah. used to call Hiles Anderson West, um, those kinds of things. And that cult of personality is what uh, is what built the, the, the modern IFB movement. And again, you'll have a few anomalies that are truly, totally independent, yeah. but the vast majority would be would, would be rooted in him. And, and I'm what I don't understand why, what do we want to steer the ship back to? Yeah. We want to steer the ship back to covering up sexual abuse. Do we want to steer the ship back to making racist jokes in the pulpit? Do we want to steer back to browbeating our, our, our the people that we're called to love and shepherd? Um, I, I don't know what we want to, to bring it back to because there is, there, there's very little associated with Jack Hiles that I would want anything to do with. And so I would say, yeah, no, don't, don't, don't bring it back. Don't, don't even identify yourself with the movement in name. Um, 
change the name if you have to. Uh, say you're a Baptist church that's unaffiliated. If you truly are stuck on that, that you can't be a part of any sort of cooperation, fine. Um, but then even in that, I would say, but you better make sure you have somebody that's allowed to come in and call you out if you're a pastor. Right. You better have people that are allowed to do that. Yeah. No, it's um, that's that's pretty much where I'm at. Is I, I think that there's a lot of things that could be restructured. I don't think that they can necessarily be restored because I think it started pretty broken. Um, you know, I think, but at the point you would do all the cleanup you need to, it would be unrecognizable as an independent Baptist church. Um, so yeah, I was curious to get your your perspective on that because I know there's some who, you know, definitely see like there's a potential of hope, and I just. I mean, doing this podcast and and talking with pastors, I just struggle with that. There are the ones who are truly independent, and their dad started. There's basically two forms of it. There's there's the there's the um, you know the the Josh Armlers of the world who I think are going to not be. I mean, they don't consider themselves IFB. They, no, and they're not. They don't have Baptists on their name anymore. And right. Those kind of so they're they're they don't last long in that movement. Or you have the Josh Tices who, you know. I think probably are, are similar. I mean, maybe he'll call me and I'll get in trouble for this, but like, I think are maybe similar in a lot of like methodology, but different in like, like music and like different standards are a little bit different. So like, yeah, sure. You know, so they get ousted by that movement. Cause like, I mean, Josh Tice was kind of the first one that was like the bad boy of fundamentalism for a while. And then just kind of, kind of got kicked out. And then you've got your, you know, the people like I've talked to recently, like Michael Poindexter or Andy Wells, who are like, you know, I think they're more affiliated than they let on. I mean, um, like Poindexter said, I'm not, I'm not affiliated and they got an honorary doctorate from John Hamlin, like a few weeks later. So, but, but you know, but their dads started churches like small country churches on their own because they read the Bible and wanted to start a church and totally respectable. Um, But it's really one of those. And if you're not one of those, you're, tied into a camp. And, and the, the, the funny thing is like when we talk about independence is it's independent of accountability and structure, but when something's needed or when there needs to be a conference about bus ministries or about leadership, there's one specific type of person that flocks out to that event and then they can assemble a thousand people to come to a spiritual leadership conference or something like that. So yeah, it's it's independent when convenient and very dependent exactly. the rest of the time. But, and that's uh, kind of the deal. And that's and that's what keeps them from getting held accountable from a legal standpoint mm-hmm. is the fact that they are technically the yes, perfect independent, it's the perfect it's, loophole. So I think I mentioned this before we started recording, and uh, I I don't know. I know that we we have different people that definitely span the political spectrum that listen and that are part of the discussion group on Facebook, but. Um, don't, don't get too upset with me here, but when you think of some, a group like Antifa, for example, right. Um, and you had this big debate between Donald Trump and, and, uh, and Joe Biden on their debate and Donald Trump said, well, what about it? Well, you condemn Antifa and Joe Biden's like, well, Antifa is not a, not a movement. It's an idea. Um, and you're like, is that technically true? Yeah. Antifa is technically just an idea. Um, but is this idea able to organize people in particular cities to do to do certain things and get movements together? Whether you think they're violent or nonviolent, that's beside the point. I'm not trying to make a political statement here. Um, I'm just saying that uh, is this idea able to get pe- actual people together with actual ideas and actually do something? Yes, they are. And that's exactly how, And but it makes it very difficult to nail them down because who's the leader? Who heads up the whole thing? Yeah. Well, no one tech. Yeah. Who's the, who that's, uh, that's the one, like, I think that they always try to mic drop me is, you know, and pastors say, well, who's the president of the IFB denomination? And yeah. it's like, look, we, come on. You we both grew up in them, it. Actually, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. But um, anyway, yeah, I was just curious to hear your perspective on that um, and, and see where you came from on that. Um, Cause it, I definitely had assumptions because of how I've seen you kind of, operate, but I was curious where you were at with that. But um, just before we wrap up, I guess I'm curious to know what's, what's next. Cause I think you've reached, I think baseline health at least with, with the church and, and feel like obviously there's always improvement to be done, but okay. you know, it's in a much better spot than it was a few years ago. What's sure. the goals for you as a pastor in the next, you know, four to five years as you're kind of trying to like think of where are we going to go next? Yeah. So I, um, 
I would say a big one is, and, th- and this is something that I would just encourage any, it's something I'm doing personally right now. I'm continuing to, uh, to do it and I would encourage other people to do. It, and it's something that I want to do with our church family. Um, and that's just grow in our theological and biblical understanding and depth. Um, because you, you mentioned a second ago, like some of these guys are just, well, I just read the Bible and I wanted to start a church. That sounds so noble. Um, but let, I mean, let's just go back to the apostle Paul for a second, right? Like a, a Paul, people talk about, they make it sound like he had the Damascus road experience. And the next moment he's out there like preaching to all these people and starting all these churches. Paul was in training for like 14 years before he went out, like 14 years. He was, he was like, he was a nobody. He was just sitting at the, the feet of like Peter and John and some of these other people and like getting taught stuff and learning. Um, and then went out and started doing everything that he did. Um, and this is something I learned from John MacArthur. While I would still disagree with a ton of stuff that he has said recently, particularly uh, recently, and, and he has yeah. really disappointed uh, me and some things that have come out of his ministry, but um, the, the idea of this, of a pastor being a theologian, like know your stuff and know when you don't know your stuff, like don't be so arrogant and so prideful that you can't admit to your church people. Like, you know what? That's a great question. I don't, I don't actually know that, but because you brought that up, thanks for pointing out something. I don't know. I need to go read. I need to go look it up. I need to go ask somebody. Um, and I would say that one of the biggest things that we want to do with our church that I, that I want to do with our church is, um, is really teach like actual like what do we believe? Why do we believe it? And then also how do we then take that and have it applied to us actually seek because part of so our mission statement here is we're a gospel centered community. We exist to joyfully glorify God as a gospel centered community focused on making disciples and seeking the welfare of our city and our world. Um, and we because we believe that's ultimately what a disciple is going to do. So it's and a disciple is not somebody that's just been that's gone through whatever West Coast Baptist College or Lancaster Baptist Church's 13 week discipleship course. You're like, now I'm a disciple. I don't need to do anything else. Here's my certificate that proves it. It's up on my wall. I'm a disciple now. I don't think that's discipleship. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, and I certainly don't think that if Peter, James and John couldn't have gotten discipled in 13 weeks, then neither can anybody else. Um, And they're sitting at the feet of Jesus himself. So I want to really disciple our people and have that be a lifelong thing and have our church reading more and reading books and discussing things and not just reading a bunch of people that we already agree with. And we're just going to go, yep, 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 yep. But it's going to make us think and ask questions and have Mm -hmm. conversations. And then it's going to cause us to then take that and go out into the world with it and help people and feed people and seek justice and do mercy and, uh, and, 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 and walk humbly with our God. Um, and so I, I, I think that's where, where I want to get us to, because I feel like for the last couple of years, we've been in sort of this, a lot of people would say, I think like we're, we're healing, we're healing, we're healing. And I think that's great and it's needed. Um, but at some point we're going to have to, while we may continue to be healing, we're going to have to not just be healing, but also get our eyes up on, on, on the world that's around us and, and look out and see the needs and see how we can help and see how we can serve other others. So. Right. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much, man, for, for coming on and for, for sharing. I know, um, what, what's up? I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, I, I wanted to make sure, uh, this has just been kind of on my heart too, that if there is anybody out there that does happen to listen to, I listened to one of your podcasts where you said you kind of hope that there's some, you know, 16 year old IFB kid in their room. That's kind of like listening to this under their covers or something. Um, and If there is somebody like that out there, whether you're the 16 year old kid or whether you're a pastor in an IFB church or you work for a pastor in an IFB church or you're, I don't know, there's all sorts of different what ifs of where you could be here. But if you wanted to talk to somebody, I know that when I started the process of like, this is not going to be my world anymore. um, It was a really, really lonely journey. Um, It is, it is, it has become where it's not as lonely now, but it, it still kind of is. Um, but especially in those early days when I, I thought kind of I was alone and I didn't know who to talk to and it felt like I couldn't, I wasn't safe to tell anybody because I didn't know that anybody would really know where I was coming from. And when you have the IFB mindset too, you kind of have this idea that people don't know as much as you do, that yes, maybe they're Christians, but they're not as good of Christians as you. Um, so I'm, I'm somebody that's been in the IFB. I've been trained in it. I've been, uh, I've been formed in it. Um, it. It was who I was. I was, I mean, I had friends that when I, 
when they started seeing some changes, they were like, you're Mr. Fundamentalist. How are you okay with this? Like you're Mr. You're, you're a West Coast golden boy and all those kinds of things. And um, I just want to say that I make my email public. Um, okay. I feel free to do that and uh, reach out to me via email. I'm not going to get my number out, <laughs> but I might over, over email. Um, and uh, it's csmith at paris.church. And uh, if you have any questions or you do want to connect with somebody and you do want to talk to them, um, please, please don't hesitate. I'm, I'm not too busy. I will make the time. Um, there were some people that really poured into me when that was, when that was happening. And if I can do that for someone else, it would be, I I would love to do that. That's awesome. Yeah, guys, definitely take advantage of that. I know, um, we've, we've talked quite a bit in the last couple of weeks, um, and kind of work, work through some of this stuff, but, uh, yeah, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on, for sharing. And you have a pretty unique perspective. And I'm hoping, you know, if there's some people who resonate with your story, which I know that there's tons of, you know, recent college graduates that probably are listening and do, um, you know, I hope they, they reach out and connect with you. Um, Cause I think it would be a big help. So. Yeah. Thanks for what you're doing, man. I know it's, I know, I, I think I, I know I've told you in the past too, that there was, when you first started this, I was like watching it and watching it sort of hesitantly and vaguely and going like, I see what he's doing and why he's doing it, but is he just bitter? Is he like, is it really necessary? Is it going to be helpful? Or is he just kind of going on his rant? And uh, I've definitely grown and I've already told this to you, but for everyone else to hear that um, I appreciate what you're doing. I hate that it is needed, but I do think that it's needed. Um, and I hope that uh, people that need to see it, will see it. And if you are out there and you're not supporting it and you're able to give even just a few bucks a, a week or a month or something like that, I'm not giving much either, uh, but I'm giving a little bit. And uh, I know everybody's tight, especially with everything going on right now. But if you can support what he's doing, um, I'd encourage you to do it. Awesome, bro. Let's pass the plates. We'll have some <laughs> special music. <laughs> we'll go from it's there. bowed and eyes closed. <laughs> so, uh, no, that's awesome, man. Well, sounds good. Uh, I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.